Hello and welcome to the Raptors show on the Sportsnet Radio Network brought to you by Camel's new chunky spicy soup. It's time to get fired up. Make sure you find the Raptor show wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, subscribe, please re-interview the program. I'm your host, Wayne Lou. I'm joined by co-host Blake Murphy. Anything going on today, Blake? Yeah, <laughs> I think so. But I think it's better for me to uh, to kick that back to you. There is yeah. uh, bigger news than uh, whatever the Raptors injury report looks like. right Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I've, I, let's just get this out of the way. I already made the announcement on Twitter, but uh, I am leaving the Raptors show. At the conclusion of this season, uh, we still have, what, Monday and Tuesday, we will still be here to do shows to, you know, address locker room clean out and things like that. But uh, yeah, uh, I'm leaving the Raptors show. It's my decision to leave. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you to the entire team that made this possible. I know um, when we do the outros and things like that, I, I always speed through them because we're up against the clock usually. But um, there, there's an entire team here at Sportsnet uh, who have like made this entire dream possible. And I know for me, when I first came into the building like three years ago, um, I was I was so ecstatic. I think this was a dream. This is a dream opportunity for anybody to cover the Raptors, but especially to this degree, especially to the degree that uh, this station has invested in this program and um you know i i got to work with two of my really really close friends the two co-hosts i'd asked for alex who obviously has also moved on and also blake um so yeah i'm just i'm just incredibly thankful uh for this opportunity and uh, most importantly I'm, I'm very thankful to all the fans who have listened i will still be in the raptor space don't worry there's like you know this is clearly my entire life um but it is something that's been so deeply personal this project and uh I'm just really proud of sort of where it's gone. I mean, I just remember like <laughs> the first day of working on the Raptors show, uh, like the very, very first day, uh, we, we got sent to Raptors Media Day. That was 2021. And immediately we got sit downs with Scotty Barnes. Uh, we got sit downs with Gary Trent Jr. And I believe Malachi Flynn. And then midway through the whole thing, uh, Fred Van Vliet walked by our booth and was like, oh, you oh, you upgraded? Oh, you upgraded <laughs> from blog boy to this really official sort of setup right here? And he actually just skipped uh, this other booth that he was supposed to go to. Uh, and he actually just came to chop it up with us. And uh, it, you know, honestly, from day one, it was like, that's way more access than we ever gotten. And of course, that's only possible through, um, you know, the, the scope and the reach of this this company and this program. So. Yeah, I'm just incredibly proud, and um, it is some, something that's been on my mind for quite a while. It's something I feel like I haven't really said to a lot of people. Um, obviously, there, when it comes to things like this, it does take, uh, I don't know, a very calculated kind of like messaging to sort of get out. But at the same time, um, I think from my heart, I just I, I put so much myself into this. I know the other people who worked on the show did as well. And it's incredible that a passion project was able to make it to this network and succeed on this network, be different on this network. And uh, I'm always going to be very, very thankful for my time here. So, yeah. And now we all know the backstory of how you first got on Fred's payroll. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, the Fred Van Vliet show with Will Lou next. Uh, um, no, look. Yeah, that man. would that'd be fire. I'm not going to lie. No, Fred, hit me up again, please. <laughs> um, look, speaking as a fan of yours, for people who don't know, we go back to the Raptors Republic days, right? Yeah. Like you emailed me the first blog you ever wrote. You were JV Hive day one. I was begging um, you. That was the thing. I begged you in that email. I'm like, Blake, please publish me for free on Raptors Republic. Uh, yeah. yeah, for free, for sure, at that point <laughs> in Raptors Republic. These spoiled blog boys now getting their, like, five bucks an article. Oh, wow. Or whatever. Um, but, no, like, I, I have seen your career grow from that to, you know, mm -hmm. we worked together at, at The Score and then obviously here. And, yeah. you know, you obviously there is a real talent there and your passion cuts through no, no matter what you're doing. But it's been really, really cool as your friend and as someone who's known you since the start of your career to see, you know, each successive step. And you wonder, okay, like, you know, you went from blog to being – on a news desk at the score. How is that adjustment going to go? You you and Alex create this awesome thing that you guys have, and it's very personal and it's very culture-oriented, and it's not something that exists in the mainstream media market, and you wonder how is that going to translate to the mainstream oh, media trust market. Me, I was wondering that as well. Yeah, <laughs> it I'm was sure, not a sure I'm thing, sure I promise. Sportsnet was too. Yeah. Um, and it's just been really cool that at each successive level, at each new challenge, you've killed it. And Alex as well. Alex is a part of what I'm saying here as well on the podcast side. Um, but yeah, as your friend and as your coworker at several different stops, it's been awesome to see you rise to each of these new challenges. I'm really excited to see what you and Alex do with this next new challenge. Um, I think from a, you know, a, a craft standpoint, the three years you've been here, the amount you've improved as a host, as an interviewer, Thank Thank the, the, the fact that every player we have on 
uh, like you you have an immediate rapport with them. Like everyone is comfortable with you, even guys at the NBA level. Uh, it says a lot about you as a person and as a professional. And I know that that comes from grinding at games and things like that, the stuff that people maybe don't see, but also the care you put into the craft and the passion you put into these projects. So um, that's been really cool to see as your friend and your coworker. And yeah, man, I'm really excited to see what you and Alex are going to do next. I appreciate you, man. Honestly, I think um, we're going to do this for like a, another few minutes and then we'll talk about actual, actual Raptors content. But um, yeah, for me personally, Blake, like you know this, but um, not just begging you for getting on Raptors Republic, <laughs> but you know, for a while there, I was just following your footsteps. When you left for the score, uh, I kind of took over a lot of like the main duties at RR as well. That's obviously where I got my start. Um, and I was so blessed to to met you, to met Zarar. Zarar already had a podcast at that time. He was really ahead of the curve. Yeah. Like the Rapcast has been around forever and it's had multiple different hosts. I was just very lucky to to have it at a very prominent time and was able to grow and develop and bring things like um, the Reaction Podcast. But, you know, when you went to the score as well, I know for my first ever job, <laughs> I also begged you. And I was like, Blake, please hand my resume in. And you did, and whatever. I still had the interview for it. I remember being like mad nervous in the Starbucks uh, <laughs> across the street. Actually, kind of the same nerves I feel now. Um, but yeah, I was just able to work with you and 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 learn so much from you. We we did Raptors Weekly Extra as well yeah. for a while in your apartment um, after your soccer games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was bringing my stinky cleats into your house. I yeah. appreciate that, and I apologize. Um, no, but it, we just kind of like kept going um, on this sort of like this this twin journey, and and. One of the coolest moments is still, like, I've told the story a few times now, but game six, there was, like, as we remember, um, that huge delay, because um, I think Draymond called timeout, but there were no timeouts or something like that. Uh, then they had to check the clock. It was, like, a solid, like, period there. Where the Raptors had the game won, it was just, like, a, a matter of formality at that point. And I think I, like, I, I grabbed your arm, and I was like, holy crap, like, we're, we're here, we're here. Um, there's and, a good, yeah. there's a good pick of us after the Eastern, after they won the Eastern Conference Championship too. There is that, yeah. They're, they're like hugging me. Oh yes, uh, yeah, like yeah. down underneath the. <laughs> that was like three a.m. Uh, yeah, that was really late. That was so like, late, and yeah. there were still people on the street when I left yeah, after oh, yeah. that to to walk home after. Right, um, that yeah, was man. after beating the Bucks. Um, no, but seriously, I've just been really indebted, and I think that like not indebted. That's not no. I, that's how I personally feel, you know. And and I, I'm always gonna be very grateful. Um, you know, when they ask when. The whole thing is like we gotta give a huge thank you to Dan Tillman, right? He he brought me to Yahoo in the first place. That gave me the opportunity of a lifetime to cover the Raptors championship. It's my first time covering the beat full time as well. Um, and then when he came over here to run Sports Night Five Ninety, the fan, we kind of had the similar conversation of like, can we bring the show to a bigger audience? And at that point, there wasn't a daily Raptors show um, that was being invested in anywhere across the country to that degree. And I think that you know Dan took a big risk there, but he also took a big risk on me being able to deliver with that and of course i asked for the co-host and they gave me those you know alex and then you as well even from the very start it was blake murphy tuesdays you know i think i went through i couldn't fully verify but there's like 913 episodes of the raptor show okay that have been put out in like the last three years which is basically once a day um and yeah i'm just i'm just really happy to have done it with you guys more than anything else it's yeah. been really really cool man and i appreciate it man obviously as a guest and then and then joining you guys kind of full-time this year um yeah, it's been awesome. And I'll still be around. Yeah, so what's going like, to happen to the like, Raptor show or just Raptors <laughs> well, coverage on the yeah, station? Yeah, I was going to say, I don't have the answer for that. Okay, um, okay. But obviously, Sportsnet is like, and this is a credit to you and Alex as well. It was like, it is that the risk you're talking about of like, mm -hmm. hey, there's not a daily Raptor show. There should be. Like, this is mostly because of you and Alex, but like the audience is there. People want Raptors content, and that's no, why people I don't are think gonna... that's a credit to us. I think that's like, look, can we, if I'm going to be completely honest about it, like the Raptors like fan base has been like, very underserved as compared to the Jays mm -hmm. fan base and the Leafs fan base. Yeah. And I think my whole thing was just like, let's just get it to on par or at least close yeah. to on par. Yeah. You know? and, and and I mean, different too, right? Like the, the way you and Alex approach it is obviously very like, I, I yeah. like coming on with you guys and doing the analytical stuff, but you mm -hmm. guys hit the team and, and what it means to be a basketball fan in a lot of different ways. And that's why people will follow you next. And I think for fans in general, so. it's, it's a win to have, you know, there's going to be one more product out there, right? Right. Um, yeah, so, for sure. You know, I, I think that's a win for for the listeners and the fan base as well. Sportsnet is going to continue on covering the Raptors yeah. uh, like they cover other teams. I'm still going to be at the station. Uh, I'm Jay's Talk Plus starts next Thursday. Oh, so, I know. Uh, yeah. I, I don't You'll have be busy. I don't have all the specific answers, but yeah, um, yeah. I think for today though, we can keep mm. the focus on, on you and uh, yeah, where you're going and. and the fact that yeah, I mean, we've already seen the Twitter response start to roll in, but people are going to be excited and people are going to follow you.
I appreciate it. I really appreciate it. And again, none of this was possible without the fans of the program. And um, yeah, I guess I'll explain more in, in due time when I have more details, but I am still going to be in the Raptors space. There's actually nowhere else for me to go. Let's be honest, right? Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of dedicating my life to covering the Raptors. I feel like you could do NBA wide too. Like you're, you're, <laughs> what I you're very same heart. I don't know. Yeah. You're that. very pot committed <laughs> to basketball for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah. All right. It'll be good. It'll be, it'll be exciting. I, I'm sure people will be excited when, when they get all the details. And then yeah. certainly as we roll into, you know, obviously we're about to hit a bit of a dead period here for the Raptors where best you'll get is some tweets about, hey, here's who's working out at OVO Athletic Center today. Yeah. Um, Miss the days when those were open to media and I lived there, basically. Oh, yeah. That's right. Um, I'm not yeah. even kidding. I walked upstairs because I, 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 I got to the office like mad early today, sat down in one of the meeting rooms and just like thought about what I was going to say, uh, how I was going to post everything. It was just, just in general, I was mad nervous. I didn't really want to bring that energy around you guys before the show. We are on air after all. But as, when I did come upstairs and I walked over to your computer, I'm not even kidding. Blake Murphy was looking up David Johnson. <laughs> David Johnson. Uh, yeah. What were you looking up David Johnson for? Man? So I have, I, I have a piece coming tomorrow just kind of on where the franchise hasn't hit as at as high a rate on the player development okay, side yeah. of things. Obviously, there are some good things. Like I think Javon is showing he could be uh, in the mix as a bench guy next yeah. year. Um, you know, so I have I have a spreadsheet going of every 10 day and two way they've ever had. Mm. Uh, so I was just double checking. Oh, I couldn't remember which G League team David Johnson was on. It's Mem Memphis Hustle, obviously. Oh, okay, uh, how right. could I forget that? But yeah. Um, yeah, so that's what I was checking. <laughs> Unbelievable, man. Yeah, you you, you do stay on brand. Um, well, listen, I, I think pivoting back to this season with yeah. the Raptors. Um, so I think we can all very much agree that this year was quite painful and it did not go according to plan, right? Um, I think we can analyze what's going to happen with the off season, what kind of went wrong this year. I think we have the shows Monday and Tuesday to, to look at those. By the way, programming note, we're expecting yeah. Raptors, at least the Raptors players to do locker clean out on Monday morning. Right. Um, we don't know how that'll line up with our schedule in terms of, you know, taking you to that live, but we'll mm -hmm. certainly be reacting to anyone who spoke, you know, kind of in the 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. So if you're looking for locker clean out day stuff, we still don't, we, we don't know when, when or if Messiah is going to speak, but the player stuff will be coming to you Monday for yeah, I'm very much looking forward to, I mean, like every Messiah State of the Union is, is quite important and monumental. But our, uh, our time slot's not long enough for it anymore, though. Oh, yeah, that is true, actually. Well, you know, we'll see. Uh, I think everyone is also pivoting a little bit off this season because it has yeah. been such a grind. And so that's why I thought today we can look at what can the Raptors do to avoid a repeat of this season? Because I do think that for everybody involved, you would want that to happen. You would want this to be the one year you step back, you take your lumps, and then you move forward. I know there's there's certainly a camp that's like, maybe you tank a second year as well. I, I, I wouldn't say that's off the table. So, but, yeah, yeah. The, the argument for that would be, especially if your pick conveys to San Antonio this year, the argument would be, well, next year's draft class is supposed to be significantly mm -hmm. better, at least at the top. So having a top five pick in a draft like that where you actually control your own pick, you could make the argument. However, to that, I would say two things. One is that organizational, culturally, teaching win at, winning habits-wise, et cetera. I don't know how long you want a guy who, like Scotty Barnes is going to sign a max extension this offseason. Mm -hmm. Emmanuel quickly is going to sign his second deal. RJ's on his second deal. Like, I don't know how long you want to be in the weeds of losing a lot uh, when some of your guys are ready. You could just, bad habits set in, guys get unhappy, whatever. Yeah. Second thing, though, is that if you look at, like the Raptors are in sixth to last yes. right now. Everything that could possibly go wrong has gone wrong. Yeah. And they're still only sixth last. You add back in Scotty Barnes for a full season, Jakob Pertle for a full season, Kelly's here now, Emmanuel Quickly and RJ are here now. You add a couple draft picks. You have cap flexibility this summer. It's hard for me to picture. Now, I don't think they're going to be like a 55-win team who blows everyone away. Mm -hmm. and we can save some of that for the second segment. Oh, don't worry. I'm about to eat part of the set as I go. <laughs> um, <laughs> Those soup cans that have been here, I'm going to have one. But I do think the path to be assuming some level of health and you have a decent offseason, it's hard to imagine this team only winning 25 games again mm -hmm. if like, like again, we'll talk about some of the, the jump stuff in the second segment, but like, what if Scotty comes back better? What if RJ and Emmanuel come back better? What yeah. if Jakob Pertl's healthy? What if you nail the draft picks that you have in the first round or, or singular draft pick you have in the first round, however it shakes out? 
Um, what if Grady's better? What if like the? Mm. By the way, great piece from Michael Granger, Sports. Oh my god, phenomenal! Everyone should go yeah, check that out. That one's about, really good. Yeah, not only like just a great profile on Grady and his family and upbringing generally, but also about the kind of conditioning stint he did mid-season and yeah. how he's gotten back to here. But let's say all of those things click that you'd want to click as a developing team. It gets a little hard to picture this team only winning twenty-five games again. Yeah, look, I don't think they'll win twenty-five games again. Um, but at the same time, we could acknowledge that you know. There is potentially a strategy if they would want to go in that direction because that 2025 draft is quite good. Yeah. And I think that, you know, with anything else, there'll be pivot points. Do you believe it. me yet that Ace Bailey's a real name? <laughs> I did so, I did see some footage of Ace Bailey, I think courtesy of uh, Lee Van Osman, who's out there in, in Portland for the Nike camp. Um, thanks to, to Lee Van for bringing that up. But, like, yeah, I mean, you know, that's, that's the draft that people might want to hit for. And I think that there is certainly a big part of the fan base that's like, now that we're this low in, in, in the standings, we might as well try. And, and that's, a, that's a, something in the background. But in general, I don't think people want to see a repeat of this year. And, and so if we're going to avoid a repeat of this season, I have really, I have three things that I think the Raptors really need to do. Okay, number one, they have to improve on defense. The Raptors this season are 25th in defensive rating. Uh, the teams below them are the Atlanta Hawks, who at least have a really good offense. But I mean, even them, they're below 500. The Detroit Pistons, who are the Detroit Pistons, the Washington Wizards, who are the Washington Wizards, the Charlotte Hornets, and the Utah Jazz, who are the only team that have tanked harder than the Raptors uh, in the second half of the season here. 25th on defense. They're even worse than Indiana, who don't even want to play defense. Okay, so in any case, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think this... For, what's the defensive ceiling of this group as is right now? Because we do know many of the core pieces, at least, around it. How good can we realistically expect this team to be defensively i mean certainly better Jakob pertle is probably the most important individual defender that they have and i don't mean that to be he's the best defender scotty has the potential to be the best defender um you know quickly when we what we saw in new york should be a better defender and, and you can kind of go down the line but in terms of how the defensive ecosystem works what we've seen in the on off impacts the last two years they need Yaka back healthy to stabilize that defense. Now, even when he was in there, they were still only around like 20th. So mm -hmm. it's not going to be, it's not going to fix everything. Um, so that's got to be better. They have to, I think, find a better balance between the Nick Nurse level aggression that we saw where it was like forced turnovers and make teams uncomfortable at all costs. Yeah. And what we've seen this year, which is they're very conservative. Yeah, they're, defensively. Actually, they're actually pretty good at not fouling. Of course, if you don't play a lot of defense, you might not foul that much. This but. is the thing. There is, <laughs> we've seen the two extremes the last couple of years really where have. it's like we'll accept fouls and we'll accept botched gambles and stuff like that because turnovers are so important and the transition right. game is so important. They've maintained the transition offense pretty well this year, but they've gone super conservative in terms of trying to force turnovers, fouling, things like that. And you'd hope mm -hmm. that by being conservative like that, you could be more steady and more stay at home, keep your man in front of you, force shots from worse positions on the floor. But they haven't done that. Yeah. They haven't gotten the benefits of being more conservative. So they need to find a better balance. So Jakob's one. They need to find a better balance between those two, uh, those two extremes of aggression. And then I think the biggest one is, and this is partially on Scotty, but it's partially on the front office and Darko in terms of what they see philosophically. They have to pick what role they want Scotty in defensively. Mm -hmm. Where we saw him thrive at times this year and look unbelievable as that lower third of the floor help side chaos defender yeah, uh, and, then we saw, and then we saw the team try him hey we want him on the top guy we want him on the perimeter we want him trying to navigate screens even though that's not as natural to him as the help side stuff i think they need to lock in what that's going to look like that'll help scotty with his defensive development that role certainty but it also helps you when you're looking at your offseason and filling in other roles, knowing where Scotty's going to be on the floor and how you're going to use your best individual defensive weapon kind of informs where else you need defenders. Okay, so I think based on what we saw this year, it's probably best to use Scotty as a help defender rather than like defending on ball. Maybe there's certain assignments where you definitely want defending on ball. There's certain, you know, games where you especially you want your star player to like take over and just like say, I got him defensively. And we've seen that uh, at times from Scotty this yeah. year. So that's really good. But in general, I think that when you look at the starting five with Quickly, with RJ, with Scotty, and Jakob already set in, we don't know who the fifth guy is. We It could be Gary. It could be someone new. It could be someone off the bench. Um, but realistically, that fifth guy really needs to be able to play um, some really damn good perimeter and, defense. And and ideally, you know, you're probably not going to be able to... We've gone over the free agent class, right? It's not a great free agent class. I don't think you're going to get someone who is bigger than RJ, so RJ yeah. can be nominally the two defensively and you have some of that size back and is also a good three-point shooter and also fits with what the other guys are. Like, yeah. you're not... And also wants to come to Toronto in a losing season. 
Let's yeah. be honest, right? You're not going to check all those boxes. Maybe you could check it by trade. Maybe use the Bruce Brown sure. thing yeah. and uh, one of the three draft picks you have or something like that. You know, people feel different ways about trading draft picks, uh, but Masai yeah, kind of made it clear post-deadline. That's a possibility. Maybe you address it that way. Um but I think given who's available and given the possibility of, say, keeping Bruce Brown or re-signing Gary Trent, the likelier is RJ is kind of the three. Mm -hmm. And then whoever that two guy is, is adding more, you know, if it's Gary, it's adding more spacing than defensive value. And then the challenge becomes individually st guys stepping up. Um, it's hard to imagine they find a move that checks, that does both of those things, kind of offensively with the spacing and defensively with the size. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, then it'll come down to, you know, how do you work those bench rotations? How do you make sure there's a stability there? Um, and how do you make sure, honestly, like, and, and part of this is going to be quickly, he's got to be better. He hasn't been as good defensively mm -hmm. here as he was in New York. Yeah. And I think part of the reason they traded for him is they see a defensive upside there. Yeah, I think my my bigger question too is with, um, with coaching as well. I think that mm -hmm. was one thing that you really did appreciate with Nick was all the tricks he would pull out of his bag defensively. There's a clear defensive identity. As you mentioned, it was really predicated on being aggressive, almost gambling, over gambling at times. But at least there was sort of that, like, ethos and that, like, emphasis. I think what, uh, part of what Nick did with that defense was he was like, look, the offense sucks. <laughs> so we're going to need to force as many steals as possible so that we can, you know, use our defense to supplement our offense. I think with Darko, he's like, the offense doesn't have to suck. Here's a different way to play. And I think the offense has flown a lot better, yeah. even with less and less talent on the roster. But at the same time, defensively, I think it's kind of just like a pretty standard setting based on what we've seen this year maybe occasionally you see a zone here or there i'm sure there are some small adjustments as you would see you know on average across the league but there's nothing distinguishing about the raptors defense and i do think that my concern stems from the start of the season you know um, the raptors had one month this year when they were above average defensively it was october yeah they played four games they were fourth on defense in those four games uh, there's just been a slide ever since. November, they were 15th, and then December, they were 22nd. When you look at before OJ Anobi was traded, that starting five was actually quite healthy. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, when you looked at it on paper, Dennis is a good on-ball pressure, you know, guy defensively. OG is OG, obviously. You know, Jakob, Pascal, Scotty is a pretty good defensive Huge. front court. Huge defensive front court with some versatility as well. They were healthy for the majority of that as well. And the Raptors were still 22nd on defensive rating before OG was traded. So healthy, in fact, that we were like, uh, why won't you change the starting lineup at one <laughs> yeah. point when it just kept not working? Uh, but yeah, and, and that slide, you know. So I, like, how much of that is on coach? Yeah, and I remember in November, like, and, and look, some of the coaching element here is maybe you know, is OG entirely locked in? Is Pascal entirely locked in? And not as a knock on those guys, but there is a real psychological factor when your name's in trades every week and you don't know what your future is and you don't know, you know, what the what the organization thinks of you. There, there's a, that's a real human element. Yeah. Um, also, you know, Darko's brand new, right? And, and I don't know if he would, add, add, like, I don't know if this is actually the case, but it certainly seemed from how they came out early in the year in training camp and stuff like that, a lot of the focus was on the offense. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, for and sure. defensively, they were going to be, and this makes sense given the talent they had at the start of the season. Defensively, their game plan was basically, well, we have good defenders, so go out and, get, go out and defend. Mm -hmm. Let's rework the offense and build offense here because we were 29th in half-court offensive rating last year or whatever. Goodness. But defensively, the good defenders just defend, and mm -hmm. that obviously didn't play out. Um, and, you know, on the kind of psychological or is it at the player level thing, I think an early warning sign that we were losing our minds about in mid-November was the transition defense was really bad. Yeah. Which when you're a huge, switchy, athletic team and anyone is supposed to be able to guard anyone, transition defense is supposed to be the thing that you're really, really good at. Mm -hmm. That's an attention to detail. That's everyone's getting back, everyone's locking in thing. Uh, and that was an early warning sign. So there's probably a coaching element there. I would imagine in the second half of the season, especially this last quarter of the season, um, basically the defensive coaching has been like, let's try to help these guys. Like, like you're not doing a lot with guys who are only going to be there for 10 or 20 days who aren't and like the, it's some of the guys playing rotation minutes are not yeah, ready yeah. for NBA rotation minutes and stuff like that. It's probably been oversimplified the last several weeks because I'm not even factoring the last several weeks because it's like you can't really fully judge anything based yeah. on that. But I, I do think at the start of the season, there was a missed opportunity. Yeah. Like there, there was an alternate universe where the Raptors could have made the talent work a lot better. But yeah. you know, we, we've been, we've been long since past that point. Uh, point number two was just protect Jakob yeah. Porto at all costs. Uh, what are they, like are, four and 25 without him or something? Yeah, maybe 4-26 and as they keep losing. Yeah, I yeah. can't remember if that counts the two wins the other day or not. It does. Okay. It does, because for a very long time, they were like 2-24, and 24, which, um, yeah, I mean, it does obviously speak to Nasty. the lack of depth <laughs> at center at, at the points where before Kelly caught in, 
But even with Kelly, and I think there is no replacing defensively what Jakob did for this group. Um, and, yeah, I mean, his injuries, and it was two injuries. It was the one where um, they were in Golden State, and he was catching an inbound pass, and him and Pascal kind of, you know, he stepped on Pascal's foot. They were both kind of going yeah. for the ball. It, it was just really unfortunate, a random play. That really torpedoed the Raptors' run at that point. Um, and then afterwards, um, you know, obviously Jakob getting hurt right after. Scotty got hurt as well. It's been difficult. This team does not win without Jakob. The uh, the on off metrics are pretty crazy. So when we look at how a team defends with a player on the floor versus off the floor, um, we have a pretty large sample of Jakob Pertl's entire career. Him impacting the defensive side of the ball. The only year he didn't weirdly was his sophomore season, which was the bench mob year. And I don't know who who knows. Sure, it, it, yeah. It's a blip. Last year when he came to the Raptors, he was the ninety eighth percentile among all big men in how you impacted a team's defense on and off the court. Now, some of that is going to be like... Sounds like a top 10 center. <laughs> so, <laughs> sounds like a reasonable trade to trade a first-round pick. We're talking... A first-round pick in three seconds. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about one... Uh -huh. We're talking about, yes, one side of the floor, and then also the fact that, you know, obviously on-off stuff, and we try to control with these stats, try to control for who you're on the court with and stuff like that, but it's always going to look a certain way if there's no backup center behind you. And you're the center. So um, 98th percentile, though, last year, impact. And then 88th percentile this year. So, again, among bigs, there are only a handful of bigs. The, the list earlier in the year was like Jokic, Miles Turner, Joel Embiid, one name that I'm missing that was maybe Hartenstein, and then Jakob. Like, those mm. are the five big men who are having the biggest on-off impact on the defensive end. Um, so even if you think that wouldn't be as extreme as they add better depth or whatever, obviously he's really important there. That's especially true... Um, you know, with defensive rebounding as well, they they just couldn't grab defensive rebounds without him on the court. Um, because That's again, a huge part, it's, yeah. it's not a huge, it, you don't have a backup center naturally, mm -hmm. and you're you're then especially post trades, the team went from being gigantic to being so small, right? That they've really gotten crushed in the defensive class. So getting Jakob back will be even if 88th or 98th percentile is a little extreme, you would still expect him to have a very big impact on your defense. Yeah, and I think the 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 good thing here is Jakob's not an injury prone guy. He really isn't. He's been, for as, as far as centers go, like really healthy. Um, played 82 games in his second season as a Raptor. 77 games, 66 games. Uh, that was the short, shortened season. So the, I think the season only 70 games. So 66 out of 70 is very good. 69 games a year not, thereafter, that's quite nice. And then 68 games, 72 last year. And then this year, just 50. Yeah. Right? So this and, obviously is an anomaly. And the, even the two injuries he suffered were like really just random free kind of incidents. Yeah, like like so. you play basketball long enough, everyone's going to have a bad ankle roll that costs you eight or ten games. Right? right. Like, like right. show me the guy who played ten years in the NBA and didn't have one of those For sure. somewhere. And then even you mentioned the San Antonio years where his games totals were in the high 60s. Oh, they tanked a couple of those games. Yeah, yes. for sure. I so re that. like how many games did he miss injured? You know, we're talking like seven, eight a season, which mm -hmm. totally reasonable for a big man. For sure. I forgot who doesn't really jump much. Uh, you shouldn't get hurt that much either. <laughs> How are you going to roll your ankle when you're not off the ground? Mark, Mark Gasol, the healthiest guy there is. It's like me playing all these uh, recreational sports, and uh, I've never tried hard, and I never will. Um, anyway, last one. <laughs> Defensively. I try hard offensively. The last one, um, I think individual players just have to show a lot of yeah. individual improvements. So this is the thing that, like, you really want to see from Darko and his team, right? They were hailed for the developmental, um, you know, acumen that they got brought in here. And I think on that level, if you're going to judge based on the developmental frame, Darko's got an A for this season, mm -hmm. right? What Scotty has done, RJ putting him in a new context, he's been really efficient. Quickly has been really solid. I mean, he's been really good anyway, even coming from New York, but he's continued to do that, and he's had some really big games recently too to build on that momentum. Grady, we saw the, the piece that Grange wrote about. There's all the detail that's gone into it. Also, shout out Evo Simonich. I'm so happy he got the, the, the credit for that one because literally every single day when you walk into the arena, you see Evo going with Dark or with Grady for like mm -hmm. a half-hour workout. And they work out on all the little details that Grange the, uh, that had wrote about in his piece. But in any case, Darko's was brought in to improve the talent that's here. So the talent here that has to continue to improve, right? It's great that Scotty took a jump forward, RJ took a jump forward, Grady fixed himself midseason, and it's been a really incredible turnaround. But like, it, there has to be more levels and more jumps to be taken. And I think that like, yes, we can expect other players to come in and supplement that group, but individually, guys got to get better as well. It's also, you. it's funny to look at where obviously this is a developmental season and toward the end of the season, they've been giving new guys a look and stuff like that. Well, four of the five youngest players on the roster are still guys who are rotation pieces for next year. And that's RJ, uh, Ochai, Scotty, and Grady. Uh, those are four of the five youngest guys on the roster. DJ Carton's the only guy younger than any of those guys. Uh, Emmanuel quickly is still only 24. So you've got five 
guys who are locked into the rotation for next mm. year who are 24 or younger. And yeah, some of those guys have played in the league for years and you, you project development a little differently once you've got five, six years in the league and, and thousands of minutes or whatever, but they're all still very young. There's a lot of room to grow. Um, you know, quickly's, been challenged to expand his role scale wise coming from New York to here. Uh, what does that look like with a whole off season? RJ has been empowered to do a little bit more and a little bit different here. What does that look like after a whole off season? Scotty obviously is such an important piece of this franchise that what level he gets to next year might dictate a lot of this, right? Oh, like, yeah, for sure. Like, Absolutely. He's the most important part of the franchise. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, Grady just being a guy who can play 82 games, 20, like 15, 20 minutes a night, and, and we can have expectations higher than that if we want. But even that compared to this year would be a big step. And, and that's before getting to, you know, the smaller end guys like, hey, is Javon a guy? Does a whole summer in their development program help him pop? Um, you know, is Gary back who is still only, you know, what, what's Gary? 25. So it's not like Gary's... Oh, the, the old guys on the team are Jordan Wara, Malik Williams, and Mo Gay, and Jalen McDaniels. Is Malik Williams, what? Malik Williams is twenty five. Uh, Jordan Wara is twenty five. Uh -huh. Mo Gay is twenty five. He's twenty five. Yeah. Wow. Jalen okay. Jalen McDaniels right. is twenty six. All right. Like the, I guess the, we're here for a good. The time other young time. guys on the team aren't that, aren't as young <laughs> as the main young guys, which is encouraging, right? It, it maybe means you look. Mo G has played like his path has been so long and uh -huh. so many stops to get here that just certainly developmentally you think maybe there's like but with Jalen mcdaniels it's like okay you probably are who you are malik williams you know interesting as a 10-day mm -hmm. guy he did five years at louisville and you know it, like he's an older prospect at this point it's exciting though that five of your core eight or nine guys are 24 and younger yeah yeah i mean look they, they did do the difficult thing this year they pivoted um you know and for once, I actually know how hard that is. So we're going to go take this break. <laughs> I'm going to eat part of this set. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm not leaving without having some chunky spicy soup. So we're going to do that after this break. I'm going to share some more spicy takes. But uh, yeah, we're going to take this break. I've been your host, Willow. You've been listening to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. Welcome back to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. I'm your host, William Luke. Continue to be joined by co host Blake Murphy, very much savoring these last few episodes. And uh, speaking of savoring, I did promise wow. I was going to eat a part of the set, and I have. If we could just pan over, we've obviously had these cans here, and there's been five of them stacked on a pyramid. Amit Mon, producer, has been diligently. I'm not even kidding. Every episode before the show, he comes in and he stacks these babies. There's finally one missing um, because on the subject of next season, uh, I have some spicy predictions to bring you, courtesy of our friends at Campbell's Chunky Spicy Soup. And I have this bowl right here of spicy chicken noodle that you've heard me brag about in pretty much every ad uh, over the last like few months. So here goes another taste test. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have some soup and then I'm going to toss a spicy or not spicy take at Blake Murphy. He's going to tell me if it's spicy or not. Uh, and there's just going to be predictions for next season. You ready to Blake? Yeah. Also, I just want to say there were more cans than five, but then I had surgery and I was like, I can only eat soup and crackers for yeah. a couple of days. So <laughs> got uh, there, used to, there used to be, <laughs> wow. <laughs> There used to be uh, used to be more cans uh -huh. around here. My bad. Yeah. All right. Prediction number one. Raptors. Back in the play-in next season. Blake Murphy, spicy or not spicy as I go for another taste test here. Play-in? Mm -hmm. They don't have to win the play-in? Let's, let's, let's make it spicier and put it in the play-in. Although this just, is really just spicy. in the play-in. Okay. That's, mm -hmm. not, uh, that's not too spicy. That, that's pretty... Mm. That's... I don't know. What, what is the like scale? It's two out of five. Maybe not even. One and a half okay. out of five spice. Not spicy um, enough. The, the Raptors are, what are they, 11 games out right now? They're 11 games out of the play-in, man. Yeah. Um, that ain't spicy that they jumped 11 wins? Well, something that helps in this case is there's only one team between them and the play-in. Like, Brooklyn's the only other team. So, right. you know, yeah, Charlotte, Washington, Detroit could all be better. But is Brooklyn going to be better? Is Atlanta going to be better? Is Sh Chicago heading into a interesting offseason with some key free agents? Are they going to be yeah. better? Um, obviously, of those teams that we just mentioned, you know, Toronto is pretty well set as far as um, prospects and, and like young rotation players and draft equity this year goes. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it's that spicy that the Raptors could get back into the play. -in. I was going to make it super spicy and say the Raptors in the playoffs next year as in top six. But then I also looked at the standings and there's a 20 win gap between them and Philadelphia right now. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, uh, yeah, that would have been that would have been, been a little been a, too spicy, probably. Yeah. Not like the soup. This is just perfectly spicy. OK, prediction number two. Spicy or not spicy, Scotty Barnes makes another jump and is named to the All-NBA teams next year. That's spicy. I, I'll, I'll say that's a four out of five spicy. Mm. Um, okay. The uh, 
look, it's not out of the realm of possibility. Scotty Barnes took a jump this year and became an all-star for the first time, but there are 26 all-star spots and there are only 15 all NBA spots. So you're saying, you know, he, he went this year into, and, and 26 all-star spots is like, there were a couple extra for injuries and things like that too. So, got so yeah. let's, let's say he's, a, he was a top 30 player mm-hmm. when all-star stuff got done. He was on the right trajectory, he was. Yeah, but he was. each successive jump, is harder than the last. And when you look at how tough the all NBA ballots are, uh, I'm not ruling it out, but I definitely think that's a spicier take than the play in. Mm. They're also kind of related takes because if Scotty takes that jump, then I feel really good about them making the play in. I'm trying to parlay these three, basically, what I'm <laughs> trying to tell you. But um, yeah, so post the outcome trade, Scotty was at 28 and 8. Unfortunately, the Raptors were 7 and 12, but like, you know what? Let's just put that aside for a second. But he's really productive, really integral to what the Raptors needed to do. And I think that. Um, it's not out of the question. Like, once you make All-Star, like, the next thing you look at is how do you make All-NBA? How do you yeah. start for the All-Star game? Those are all, like, you know, great um, goals to try to aim for. And they become realistic when you make your first All-Star game. So, um, yeah, I think we all believe that Scotty has the potential and the ability to do it. It's just about how quickly he gets there. And and to some degree, know. the team around him. Because, oh, like, for sure. like, you look, don't do this unless you're, like, a winning team. If you're yeah. the best player in the league, then, yeah, you're going to make All-NBA, whatever. There are instances of yeah, guys. If you're LeBron on, and you're like, the, you're, like, Steph Curry of the 10th seed, it's like, yeah, actually, you're still going to be All-NBA. Yeah, yeah, but if you are trying to do it for the first time and you are a younger player, your mm-hmm. team's got to be good, too, because... Again, like like with All Stars, where coaches kind of go down the standings, media vote on All NBA, but there is definitely a, a team component there. All right, spicy or not spicy? Prediction number three: RJ Barrett or Emmanuel Quickly, one of the two, is named All Star for next year. That's spicy. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. I think that might be mm-hmm. as spicy as the Scotty Barnes All NBA, and again, kind of related. You mean be- I got to do the Idris Elba meme right now? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was um, more like a Jada kiss. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that one's tough. I mean, neither of them were particularly close this year. Mm. They could get there numbers wise. Um, but as, again, this is going to be all these takes being related. Yeah. You're only getting two all stars if you're in like the top four or five in the East, probably. Uh, right. Like a play in level. Like even the Celtics only got two. Yeah, like yeah. a play in level team. Like the Hawks couldn't. Trey Young only got in his injury replacement, right? Uh huh. Yeah, he did. And then the Bulls didn't have anyone there. Nope. Uh, the Heat didn't. The Heat had Jimmy. Yeah, they had, uh, did it, did it have, was Bam an All Star this year? Oh yeah, so they had two, Bam, but Bam yeah. was voted in. Yeah. So the Heat, okay, so the Heat were a playing team that had two, but they're the Heat. They're coming off a Finals run and stuff like that. Are they um, Bam? I feel like Jimmy wasn't an All Star. Maybe this Jimmy year. wasn't an All Star. Maybe yeah. he hadn't played enough games. Mm. Um. Anyway, so either way, yeah, he okay. was not an All Star this year. There you go. There you go. So yeah. they only had one as well. So as a playing team in the East, you probably need to be outside of the play-in yeah. uh, to get two guys. And then also one of those guys has to take a leap because, right. you know, RJ is going to have the points totals. Emmanuel quickly have nice points and assists. But if you're not at least a 500-ish team when people mm-hmm. vote, I don't think, like, the coaches aren't putting two of your guys on there. All right. Uh, this is pure propaganda. But let me let me hit you with some of the numbers, too. So RJ, since joining the Raptors, 21 points per game, six rebounds, four assists, shooting 55% from the field, 40% from three. I'm not going to say the free throw percentage just doesn't help the propaganda effort here. But, but also, like, you're saying, so 21-6-4 and four on 55-40 shooting. That's pretty is, good. It's really, really good. Trey Young only made the all-star team as an injury replacement. Yeah. Now he was, like, 30-10. and 10. <laughs> Yeah. It's tough out right. there, man, especially it, it in, the, in the there. offensive explosion. Like, mm-hmm. we did these numbers earlier in the year where the number of guys averaging – 25 a game now right. is the same as the number of guys who were averaging 20 a game like seven eight years ago there was a bit of inflation like 25 is the new 20 yeah and then iq at 19 5 and 7 i mean like uh it, it, look if one of these two things happen like as in terms of one of them makes all-star level the raptor season has gone phenomenally yes so so i'm gonna yeah. kick a uh, question back to you here okay of Wait, can those, I, before those... i say that though can i just say thanks once again to campbell's chunky oh. spicy soup for sponsoring the raptor show this season Never thought I'd be eating soup on air as my job. And uh, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful perk of doing this. So a big thanks to, to Chunky. All right, what, what, was, what are you going to throw back? Can't wait until Tuesday when I take all these home because <laughs> there's no more shows to have them on board for. Sorry, yeah. uh, Ahmed, I, I got dibs. Um, okay. About to throw soup at each other like the Cavs <laughs> back in the day. Oh, yeah, tortilla soup, J.R. Smith. <laughs> what, a, what a time for investigative reporting in the NBA. Uh, so you made three predictions there. The Raptors are back in the play-in. Mm-hmm. Scotty Barnes makes another jump to All-NBA. And R.J. Barrett or Emmanuel Quickly are named All-Star. Again, obviously those three things are, are at least somewhat related because everyone being better together will we'll push certain things higher. Um, which one are you most confident in happening? And if you could only pick one, which would it be? Um, honestly, the Raptors back in the play-in. Okay. Yeah. And not to, pl- not to say the plan is, like, to be on end all. No one's, like, 
Oh man, I can't wait to the, be in the play. The thirty six and forty four Hawks. No, I mean like I can't wait for the eighty two game season again to yes. be like meaningful. Yes. Like I think at certain point this year, this year was it was such a lost season because like it was about who can they trade these guys for? Should they pivot? Obviously, it was pretty clear that they should pivot. The overwhelming response to that, the debates around like you know this guy doesn't fit, this guy doesn't fit, this guy's checked out. This all it was just like man, it was like who could have we gotten for this and this? It was about everything except for the basketball on the court. And honestly, if you did make it about the basketball on the court, it was bad basketball. Yeah. So Octo- if, October's a beautiful time. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you can always, like, talk about all these other things. And I think all these things will come with winning. Um, and all the things will factor into the winning. But I can't wait for the A2 game season to be actually meaningful again, to see them being close competitive games. And even if they lose, you, we break down why they lost. We look at the, the sort of factors that went into it. Rather than, like, we come in every single day and we're like, hey, Mark Stein, um, it, what's the latest on Bruce Brown? Is, can we get a first-round pick? Like, that that was a decrepit time in franchise history. I, I, I'm not going to lie. That was that was tough, me just begging Mark Stein to say there, there's a first-round pick out there for him, yeah. which he never did, by the way. No, and apparently there was not. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't uh, think Bruce Brown would be a Toronto Raptor. But you know what uh, I mean, though? Like, I, I want the games to matter again. Yes. Yeah. yeah, like I'm looking at the schedule here and trying to remember the last time. Like, obviously, the OG trade kind of signaled that the games didn't really matter anymore at that point, even though that was only 32 mm-hmm. games into the season. Um, but you can go back pretty far. Like they hit a, they hit a pretty good stretch of losing in late November where it was like the writing was on the wall. So we got like six weeks yeah. of like, Hey, maybe this, th- and obviously there are things that matter. Scotty matters. Like I'm not saying none of it matters, but yeah. in terms of like being really emotionally invested in the outcomes of individual games. And if they didn't go your way, the why and how to fix that, we got like six weeks of that. Mm-hmm. It's not a lot. Yeah. It's been a lean year. It's been a lean year. Dude, they lost 15 in a row. I hate looking at the schedule page. I don't know why I'm doing this. It's actually pretty incredible. I feel like it did fly by, though. Like, I was looking at the, just like what you're doing right now, looking at all the games in in order in the spreadsheet. And I look at each individual line, and I do remember, like, specific things about every single game. Now, of course, that that comes with, like, doing the coverage. And By the way, I did get an update from producer JR. Um, JR Manitad informed me during the break that I think I had said there was like 900 episodes of the Raptor show. There's actually over 1,400. There's 1,400 episodes of the Raptor show. Still, uh, There will still be four more, at least after this one as well, too, um, with the two React pods and the two more shows next week. But like, we've only been, I've only been here like 900 days, man. Like, yeah. That's that's like a pot and a half per day. It's, it's ridiculous, especially considering the fact that there's long off seasons too. But in any case, like, it's, yeah, I do remember things about each individual game, and it did kind of fly by. And I, I think at the beginning of it, I was really absorbed game by game. And as you could tell recently, it's just like, all right, we can look at the bigger picture and not look at the thing. And it's like you're intentionally not looking at the main thing because mm-hmm. you can't because they're losing so much. Also, like they're not playing players who will matter later. They're not, That's you know, yeah. like if it would be one thing if the defense had just not improved all year and it was the same guys and you were trying new stuff or like you couldn't get the basics and they were trying new stuff mm-hmm. and they weren't getting that either. But like, yeah, I'm I'm not... I can't get too upset that like a lineup with Jordan Wara, Jaden McDaniels no. and or Jalen McDaniels rather and Malik Williams like right. isn't getting it done defensively. Like it's not, yeah. I don't know, the the specifics of it. Obviously the games are still fun. The individual stuff mm-hmm. matters, but it is, it's like lower fidelity information. Like you're just not yeah. getting as much from it. There's not nearly as much signal. No, what, what was uh, the other game of, you know, one of the people that has had a difficult season this year in terms of just how tough their job has been, has been, has been Strizzy who does the <laughs> intros. And the other it's day, game on for Javon Freeman Liberty. Oh man, it's not like we didn't have Ken Birch for a while. We started Ken Birch quite a bit, and his whole thing was uh, representing We the North, <laughs> number twenty four, Ken Birch, <laughs> which we just had a lot of fun times that day. And it's not about like I, I feel like Strizzy does a great job introing the whole team and everything like that. I just mean that like yeah, he's he's had to create a lot of unique intros this year. Yeah, yeah, there's a, it's a lot game of, on for Javon is, is is a new one, man. Although, hey, he had a career night the night <laughs> that the on. night that that happened. It was it was game on. Uh, <laughs> speaking of game on, it's time now for between the lines. Brought to you by Bat oh, Rivers. Yeah. Take a chance. The Let's final go. one of these of the season because the Raptors play tonight and then they close the season out on mm. Sunday. They play against a Miami Heat team tonight that needs this game. Uh, if Miami were to lose tonight. Or Orlando were to win, the Heat are locked into the play-in. Technically, they could get out of the play-in still. Uh, um, they're, they're pretty also, much locked in. They're mostly locked in, but they could also get home court for the play-in, which right. is important. Exactly. You'd rather host Philadelphia than uh, than travel to Philadelphia and then have to travel back to Miami for that second game mm-hmm. if they lose. Uh, so there is stuff on the line for Miami. As a result, 
The Raptors are 14 and a half point underdogs. Oh, uh, the over under set at 218 and a half. Bruce Brown and Gary Trent are questionable with the knee and back issues, respectively. The usual guys are out. Nobody listed as resting oh, uh, yet. That's nice. On the Heat side, Terry Rogier is questionable with a neck thing. Uh, Josh Richardson and Duncan Robinson remain out. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I, I find it very difficult. I mean, there's just very, there's two entirely different set of motivations going to this game. Um, I know Garrett already told us yesterday that he expects to play a lot of minutes, and I'm expecting probably game 82, but it could be game 81 as well. I mean, what's the difference, really? Um, in any case, uh, I, I think that it'd be, look, I mean, we say all this, but we're going to miss watching this team. Of course. No matter who they are. And, well, that's not true, actually. I won't miss watching Jalen McDaniels, but like... <laughs> Uh, regardless, like you will watch miss watching this team, even though they've been struggling. So I, I will very much try to soak it in, but I do not expect a competitive game. Um, or I don't expect the Raptors to have any chance of winning this game. Quite frankly, I mean, it would be a major disaster for the Heat if they didn't win this game comfortably. So I will obviously back the Heat to, to this one, and also for Game Eighty Two as well. I don't know when asked, but I think that's pretty clear. But yeah, I just want to see Grady continue to thrive. Uh, it's been really fun watching him quickly. RJ, all three of these guys have done really well. And like we mentioned earlier, they're going to need to continue to improve and, you know, finish the year on a high note, even if you are just finishing out the year to finish out the year. All right. So here's what I want out of this weekend. Okay. And I don't mean this disrespectfully to Malik Williams, but his 10-day runs out after tomorrow. Oh, my goodness. All I care oh, from goodness. this weekend Give me Marquise Noel on a, on oh, a yeah. one. Like, technically, yeah, yeah. you can't sign a 10-day anymore. You'd have to sign him for the rest of the season. Um, Who cares? Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, it still costs the same amount of money. It's just what you have to do. Um, yeah, so... Oh, no, actually, you... So, sorry, technically, you can't sign a 10-day. Yeah, so you'd have to sign him to rest of season. I think at this point, it would have to include, like, a non-guaranteed next year or whatever. That's fine. Yeah, you can do whatever. Yeah. Uh, I would like to see Marquise Noel, who was really, really fun with the 905, who the fan base really likes. He has a big following. He fought back from hamstring injury and stuff like that. Uh, he did play once earlier in the year in garbage time, but I would rather get, you know, 25 minutes of that than, uh, hey, poor Malik Williams, you got to start and play 30 again. And I know the Raptors would be incredibly small, but hey, Garrett Temple could play 48 minutes of center. Yeah. Um, okay, so first off, that was Between the Lines brought to you by Brett Rivers. Take a chance on the Miami Heat uh, this weekend. <laughs> um, before we go for this week, uh, who do you think will be the starting five for game 82 of the season? All right. Let's uh, put Marquise in there for you, okay? Bobby Webster is listening to the show once again, and he's like, you know what? Blake's totally right. You know what? This is a good idea. We're signing Marquise. He doesn't even need to start. I just want to see no, no, him no, no, get no. that. Let's, let's, let's start yeah. him. Let's start him. Okay. And then Garrett Temple's in the starting group. Who else yeah. is in the starting group? What's uh, the rotation? Moji is going to start at center. Moji's going to start at center. Okay. Wow. Um, we still about the rob of these yeah. days. like OMP. Probably Jordan Wara in there somewhere, and then Grady. Wow, that's the, you know what? That's still a lot better than Game eighty two when the Raptors were in Tampa. That's one of my favorite games of all time. They started Aaron Sick Baines up. at shoot at, at, at like small forward, yeah, and they were running plays for Aaron Baines as a movement shooter. <laughs> yep, Ken Birch and Freddie Gillespie uh, can't space the floor like Aaron Baines can't. They're not the movement shooters that Aaron Baines is. It was DeAndre Bembry and Malachi Flynn, and I believe Stanley Johnson Stanley. only played like five minutes or something. Yeah. He like it was kind of basically they played six guys. Yeah, yeah. This is, and I mean, the Ben Uzo game is another fun yes, game, or yeah. I was going to say game 82, but game 66, where like Jamal McGlure started, but only played five minutes. Solomon Alabi had like a career high minutes. Yeah, speaking of Solomon Alibi, you, you taking Solomon Alibi or Muhammadu Gay? Oh, I'm taking Moji. He's, yeah, he's got really? a little more bounce. Yeah, let's mm. see it. I don't know, man. That's a close one for me. But the fact that that's even close is, is a tough spot. So anyway, that does it for us today. I've been your host, Willow. You've been listening to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. It's time to get fired up. Make sure you listen to The Raptor Show, wherever you find podcasts. Please subscribe, rate, and review the program. Thanks once again, producer Albert Mon for heating the soup, most importantly. Our board producer, Lance Kennedy, Jennifer Olnick, David Sis, Jared Manitat for helping behind the scenes. I'll be back. Two more shows next week. <laughs>